given the COVID, with the COVID lack of childcare, uh, you know, uh, it's possible that a six-year-old will be expressing some opinions about the nature of dark matter at some point. Okay, so let's let's get started. All right, so um, so we uh, so things started going bad yesterday when um, I was talking about n-body problems. So n-body problems are problems where you have a coll collisionless or nearly collisionless um, set of particles that you're trying to simulate. Or, um, and so, um, and so uh, the, the first and most important set of n-body problems center on the cold dark matter paradigm. So cold dark matter is sort of our standard paradigm for dark matter. It's a uh, what I would say astronomical or cosmological classification of dark matter candidates. Phenomenologically, this means that cold dark matter is non-relativistic during its birth epoch. Um, it's stable on cosmological timescales. And it, in the purest form of cold dark matter, it is completely non-interacting beyond gravity. Now, often you'll hear WIMP and cold dark matter used interchangeably. WIMPs are not pure cold dark matter because WIMPs do interact a little bit. Yeah, that's how we get this, you know, the WIMP miracle that, um, that if you just do essentially dimensional analysis, um, you find that WIMPs produce uh, basically exactly omega matters worth of dark matter in the universe. Okay, the fact that that happens depends really on the cross section of dark matter, the annihilation uh, cross section. Okay, so so cold dark matter and WIMP are used interchangeably, but it's not a one to one and on to relation. So WIMPs are almost cold dark matter, and for the purposes of simulation, uh, they are cold dark matter. Uh, the amount uh, that WIMPs interact is negligible uh, for simulation purposes. On the other hand, there are other types of cold dark matter. So for example, QCD axions are a form of cold dark matter. Um, so so uh, anyways, just keep that in mind. So WIMPs and cold dark matter are basically almost, or sorry, WIMPs and axions are almost cold dark matter. For the purposes of simulation, they are cold dark matter. But uh, uh, there are terms that should not be used uh, interchangeably uh, in any in uh, if you care about precision definitions. Okay, so if we go to this orientation plot of when you're trying to figure out how to simulate a set of particles, what sort of considerations to have? Cold dark matter lies here in this huge number and extremely high Knudsen number regime. Um, okay. Uh, all right, so that means, so uh, yesterday I uh, talked about solving the Boltzmann e Poisson equations. In detail, when you have this uh, kind of um, n-body problem, uh, cold dark matter is collisionless <laughs> uh, for all, uh, intents and purposes. And so what that means is that we're really solving the collisionless Boltzmann equation. And then for the Poisson equation, if you only have one species of cold dark matter particle, um, then you can sort of um, uh, erase the sum here over i, which is particle species. And then your uh, the gradient, or sorry, the um, del squared of the potential is just four pi g times the mass density of dark matter. Okay, so that's the coupled set of equations that we solve in n-body problems. Um, and of course, then we have to coarse grain uh, this problem. So uh, we talked about each simulation particle is really representing a patch of phase space, so really an ensemble of, of microphysical dark matter particles. And, um, and when it comes to the actual simulations, what we're really doing 
is we're solving a set of equations of motions, equations of motion for the simulation particles. So we basically take each simulation particle, figure out what the gravitational force is at that particle's position and evolve that uh, simulation particles motion according to the time dependent um, gravitational uh, field. And we figure out the gravitational field at each time step by considering the gravitational field from all the simulation particles. Okay, so this is where the leapfrog integrator that I talked about Tuesday comes in. So we use a leapfrog integrator to basically um, evolve uh, the, uh, the particle positions and velocities according to um, the gravitational force. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, so this is sort of the framework that I started talking about by how we how we then you know start with a set of initial conditions for particles and then solve to some later time. So um, so again, we should think about this particles, uh, dark matter particles. We should describe it in terms of a distribution function instead of uh, you know thinking about individual particles, we're coarse graining the space space density. We need a set of initial conditions and then we need um, a method um, to solve this Boltzmann uh, Poisson set of equations. Um, okay, so uh, there are two different types of initial conditions that people generally use for simulations. And um, what I will say is the initial conditions you choose depend on the kind of problem you want to solve. So one set of initial conditions is um, for what I will call Newtonian problems. So this is a case where you might want to have a staged set of simulations. So for example, uh, this is um, a snapshot from uh, a movie that my former student, uh, Dr. Stacy Kim, made to try to understand the evolution of mergers of galaxy clusters. So in order to understand the dynamics of galaxy cluster mergers, because these are very rare events cosmologically, at least in the case where you have two massive clusters smashing into each other, like the bullet cluster, um, the way we tried to understand the dynamics is that we started with equilibrium dark matter halos, and then we smashed them at each other. Um, another, um, another typical application is trying to really understand in detail the evolution of subhalos inside a massive host. Um, so there's, an, um, there's quite a bit of work by, for example, Jorge Peña Rubia, Rafael Arani, um, and some work I'll talk about in a little bit by Gertina Besla and Nico Garavito Camargo, where you're really trying to understand in detail the evolution of a smaller body inside of a larger body. So those would be examples where you want to create sort of equilibrium halos and then smash them at each other and then follow the evolution. Um, and so one of the exercises that I put in the folder is um, to generate your own equilibrium initial conditions. Um, and so these are non-cosmological. You just start with a halo that when you create the halo, the halo properties like density, profile, and position don't change with time. They should be static. The other type of initial conditions people use are cosmological. So in this case, um, you start at very high redshift where you can still use perturbation theory. And you basically um, create a realization of the density and velocity field at some early epoch. Typically, when people start cosmological simulations, they're starting them at about a redshift of 100 for um, you know, the typical use cases, which is considering uh, the evolution of galaxies um, in either zoom, uh, zoom boxes or in large boxes um, at to redshift zero. So one of the codes that people often use is 
this code called music by Oliver Hahn and Tom Abel. I've shown, so took in a, taken a screenshot of the abstract, uh, screenshot of the abstract of the archived version of this paper. But this paper describes how they generate initial conditions for some realization of a patch of universe for a, a given cosmology. Um, also check out Volker Springer's uh, 2005 Gadget 2 paper about initial conditions if you're interested in learning more about how to generate um, cosmological initial conditions and what kinds of considerations um, you should be thinking about when you're creating initial conditions. Okay, so, uh, okay, so we're in the second half now of the step three. So we've we realized we really need to think about phase space densities. We've coarse grained it by splitting, you know, particles and or patches of phase space into these um, simulation particles. We've generated our initial conditions of those coarse grain simulation particles, and now we've got to evolve them. And there are two very common approaches um, to this evolution. What I should say is that Oliver Hahn and um, Tom Abel and collaborators and several other groups have pioneered some novel uh, approaches to solving the collisionless Boltzmann Poisson equations. But um, those are not really uh, used so much currently in simulation codes. Instead, I'm going to talk about the two most common approaches. So one approach is the tree approach, which is a gridless approach. Um, and so as I, we had a discussion yesterday, although the sand was choppy, about why, why you, one would use one of these approaches rather than just essentially doing one long problem where you do direct summation. And there are two, a couple of issues. So one is, um, so one way to figure out how to evolve a particle in this gravitational field is to basically do pairwise forces. So do minus G M1 M2 over R squared. That's the gravitational force uh, by one particle on another. And you can sum up the contributions of the force of all those uh, N minus one particles on one particle. But then you have to do that for N particles. And so that's an N squared operation. So it means that every time step where you're calculating the force, um, you're doing n squared force calculations. And that is very expensive. So um, one way around this is to chop up this um, space in uh, according to this tree method. So this is a method pioneered by Barnes and Hutt in the mid 80s. And in this case, like if you're this particle out here, uh, you would find the gravitational force from, for example, like this box or the particles that are in this box. Um, and there are specific criteria that you have for uh, what's called opening a, tr a, a leaf in this tree or not. Um, but basically by chopping up the space like this and calculating the gravitational force, from particles in one of these boxes instead of the individual particles, you go from an n squared operation to an n log n operation. Um, okay, so we're calculating forces directly, but we're sort of grouping particles together um, so that we can do the calculation quicker. Um, and again, there are sort of basically accuracy conditions that are embedded in this, um, in this tree code. Uh, or tree codes, I should say. Um, another thing I should say is that typically for these problems, uh, you put in a softening for each particle. What that means is that if you have two particles that are really close together, um, you don't calculate the gravitational force as you know minus g m1 m2 over r squared. Instead, you soften that potential to avoid the one over r squared divergence, and that's because these simulation particles like for cold dark matter, cold dark matter is collisionless. So you don't want to have a spurious gravitational, very close two body interaction because that's unphysical. So you basically have to create some way to avoid those spurious, you know, 
at sharp two body collisions on small scales. And so the way around that is to soften it, basically to try to cancel that one over r squared infinity. So you kind of regularize that. Um, uh, and so there's also a whole body of literature um, having to do with um, uh, convergence and what, how exactly you should set the softening. There's a famous paper by Chris Power from 2003 uh, that describes uh, how to set the softening for a simulation. Okay, so that's one approach. The other approach is a grid-based approach. And in this case, what we're doing, like before we were calculating the gravitational force directly when we're evolving particles along the simulation particles according to these equations of motion. But in the grid approach, what you do is you're actually solving for the gravitational potential first, and then you're applying a derivative to get the force. So um, again, you plop down a grid, you count up the particles in the grid, um, and then you do an FFT. Um, and so uh, you do an FFT on the, uh, which stands for fast Fourier transform. You do that on the density field um, from, you know, from your grid-based density field and uh, figure out the Fourier transform potential. And then you transform back to find the real potential and then you take a derivative to find the gravitational force. So again, this is an approach to directly solve for the gravitational field, not the gravitational force. And then you evaluate the gravitational force um, from the field at the positions of individual simulation particles. All right, and so let's see what the codes actually use. Um, so some of the codes, like this art code, uh, use um, uh, uh, purely a particle mesh, this grid-based approach. Other codes, um, and of these, uh, my group has used Gadget and Arepo by far the most. Um, these are sort of hybrid approaches, so where you use the tree method to calculate gravitational forces for in dense regions. And then for larger scales, in so which on average are less dense, then using this um, grid-based approach. Um, one thing I said yesterday and I'll say again now is that Gadget 2 was a public code, I guess still is from 2005, but last year Volkash Pringle, the author of it, um, released a new public version called Gadget 4, which scales better on large supercomputing systems. So this Gadget 2.3 code has been superseded by Gadget 4. And you can download it and play with it yourself. Um, OK. Um, and notably, uh, instances of many of these codes are public. So you can, you can there's nothing stopping you from getting a copy and um, doing your doing your own simulations. Okay, so if you decide to download one of these codes and you know just start experimenting with them, there are a couple of things to just be aware of um, and things to check. So one good check is to make an equilibrium halo and evolve it in isolation. Um, uh, and if the halo moves, that tells you that there's an issue with the gravity solver. Um, this is an issue that's come up a couple of times um, uh, when we've been running equilibrium halos as tests before we do the halo smashing uh, simulations. Um, and it's a good check to make sure that you have all, that your code, that basically you downloaded and installed the code properly, that you've set all the parameters in the parameter file properly and that you're getting a physical result. So that's a good test. Um, another thing to be aware of is that if you have two identical sets of initial conditions, but anything about your the way you're solving the equations of motion changes, um, then, um, then 
you should not expect to get exactly the same simulation output at a later time. You should expect your outputs to be statistically the same, but not identical. And so one example of this is um, in the Elvis uh, simulation suite, which are zoom in simulations of Milky Way like dark matter halos. This was the thesis work of Shea Garrison Kimmel when he was a grad student at UC Irvine. And he had two simulations with identical initial conditions, except one was a little higher resolution than the other. And so one of those halos had a large Magellanic cloud in it, I think the lower resolution one, although I could be wrong, and the other one uh, didn't. Uh, that other one had a large Magellanic cloud outside the varial radius. But because of this numerical chaos, um, the, the final sort of like positions and velocities of the subhalos and halos in that simulation weren't the same for the two cases. And that's because um, that's because if you have slightly different either initial conditions or ways of solving the equations of motion, um, then you're going to get a slightly different. Uh, the system's going to look slightly different. OK, and so that's just something to be aware of. So to not freak out if when you run two, uh, two halos where you either have different realization or not necessarily halos, but if you have cosmological initial conditions that are different realizations or where you have the same realization, but one is a little higher resolution than the other, or if you change anything about how you're evolving the equations of motion, at redshift zero, your systems are gonna look a little bit different. Okay, so that's CDM. Let's talk about not CDM. Um, so the first instant, first type of model um, or dark matter candidate uh, that I wanna mention is warm dark matter. Um, so warm dark matter models, um, so include like sterile neutrinos, like KEV mass gravitinos, um, other candidates that perhaps some of your other lecturers have mentioned. Um, the thing that's different between warm dark matter models and cold dark matter models is that warm dark matter uh, particles are born semi-relativistically. And what that means is that uh, the particles then can essentially fly out of small scale overdensities. So inflation or something like it lays down um, a set of perturbations on a variety of scales. If you have the vanilla -ist of inflationary models, then you get a scale free set of perturbations. But uh, when dark matter, warm dark matter particles are born or uh, freeze out or whatever is the thing where suddenly the uh, omega dark matter has become fixed in time. At whatever epoch that is sometime after inflation, those particles are semi-relativistic. So they're gonna fly out of small scale over densities. And so what that means is that you suppress the matter power spectrum on those small scales and your particles have, uh, have higher velocity than the cold dark matter particles. Um, and so as a result, when you look at, for example, this, these Milky Way uh, dark matter halos, um, this one to the left is CDM simulated by Falker Springer, and this one on the right is a sterile neutrino um, dark matter model simulated by Mark Lovell. Um, what you'll notice is that the warm dark matter model just does not have that many small halos. Now, simulation-wise, um, you simulate warm dark matter halos just like you do cold dark matter halos. You use the same, you know, Boltzmann, Poisson solving approach. The thing that's different compared to cold dark matter is how you set the initial conditions. And um, so uh, I would recommend checking out Mark Lovell's paper and other warm dark matter papers to see how in detail um, they set uh, cosmological warm dark matter initial conditions. Um, 
There's also a nice paper by Andrea Macho called um, The Catch-22 Problem of Warm Dark Matter. Um, and that's another fun paper to read on the subject of initial conditions. Um, okay. So the one technical issue with warm dark matter models is um, that unless you are really careful about how you um, uh, calculate gravitational forces on small scales, is that you end up with um, artificial halos, which uh, these are a couple of plots from a paper by Mark Level. This is where halos are at redshift zero. And this is on the right is where the particles that go into this halo, where they lie in co-moving coordinates at the beginning of the simulation. Um, and the, so this, the red and blue halos here are real halos. You can see that um, in the initial conditions, they inhabit these blobby regions <laughs> in co-moving coordinates. Um, but these, oops, the spurious halos here arise from basically sheets um, in the initial um, in the uh, initial conditions. And what the what, what where these come from is basically like for warm dark matter you're not supposed to have any power on these small scales or very little. But when you're simulating these halos, you're basically sampling this density field and you can have Poisson fluctuations, when you, especially when you have a relatively low number of particles, you can have these spurious Poisson fluctuations that then just grow. <laughs> these Poisson overdensities that grow. And so there are different techniques in the literature for how to work around these spurious halos to not count them in your halo mass function. Um, and there are other approaches, uh, and I refer you to this paper by Han et al, of ways to suppress the growth of those spurious overdensities by basically having uh, more clever treatments of gravitational forces on small scales. Um, so anyways, that's just buyer beware if you're simulating any type of um, dark matter model where you have suppressed power, um, then uh, beware of artifacts. Okay, so let's talk a little bit then about a different case where you actually have to do something different than your standard cold dark matter type simulation. And that's the case of self-interacting dark matter, like where you're no, no longer solving the collisionless Boltzmann equation, but instead, because your Knudsen number is a, of order unity, you're not solving the collisionless Boltzmann equation. You're also actually not solving hydrodynamic equations. You're doing something in the middle. And there is now a ever-growing literature on how to properly simulate dark matter that has uh, some kind of self-interaction. Um, it turns out there are a lot of subtle issues and your approach for modeling the scattering will depend in part on the nature of the scatter. So historically people talked about self-interacting dark matter um, as basically like hard sphere scattering. So you have like billiard ball type scattering, which means that you have a lot of large angle scattering. The approaches that you use to model that are a, uh, can be different from cases where you have dominantly small angle scattering. Um, and the theme for all these methods is that what you're really trying to do is you're not trying to think about these individual simulation particles as basically being souped up versions of microscopic dark matter particles. But instead, what you're really trying to model is the um, uh, flux of uh, momentum and energy in the system. Um, and so what that means is that instead of considering often just the microphysical cross-section d sigma d omega, we're often considering the transfer or velocity, or sorry, viscosity cross-section. And you need to pay attention to whether those cross-sections are anisotropic or not. So 
if you're interested in learning more about the how to think about the scatter, how to basically take the microphysical interactions and then properly model the flow of energy and momentum in the system, check out this very nice paper by uh, Felix Kalhofer from 2013. You can check out uh, my paper with Miguel Rocha from 2013. And then recently there are some pretty great papers by Andrew Robertson, or I should say led by Andrew Robertson, Orca Banerjee and um, uh, Felix Kalhofa and his group. Um, but basically, yeah, um, in all these cases, you have these simulation particles. You're looking at for the nearest neighbor simulation particles, and you basically do a probabilistic interaction and momentum and energy transfer with nearby simulation particles. Um, but anyways, there's a whole literature on it. I've got a bunch of references in the reference document on uh, Google Drive. Uh, and, and final thing I'll say about this is that we really need to do as a community code comparison tests. Um, and currently Ethan Nodler, who is a postdoc at USC and Carnegie Observatories has started working on this, but it's gonna be a big project to do properly. Um, one of the really challenging things with self-interacting dark matter is um, the fact that actually the Knudsen number can span a wide range <laughs> of values. Um, and so, uh, and this becomes especially problematic when the halo core collapses. So core collapse is a result of a physical phenomenon called the gravothermal catastrophe. And this is a phenomenon first explored in the context of globular clusters. But basically, uh, self-gravitating systems have negative heat capacity. So uh, what that means is that the center part of a self-gravitating system contracts and becomes hotter. And then the outer part of the system expands and becomes colder. And it's this runaway process where the center part gets hotter and hotter and denser and denser and the outer part becomes lower temperature and expands. Um, so this is a plot from a paper from Ruben Essig's group at Stony Brook, where they show the evolution of a density profile. So this axis here is density, this here is distance from the center of the halo, and then this axis is time. And initially you have relatively high Knudsen number at the center, so not super collisional, uh, but then as a result of this gravothermal catastrophe, the center region uh, gets denser and denser and actually enters this fluid regime where the Knudsen number is very, very small. And that becomes very hard, or rather I should say very computationally intensive to simulate. Um, the thing that really drives the long computing time for this as well as for hydrodynamic simulations is the fact that you've got high densities. And that means that you have to take very small time steps because the dynamical time is so short in those regions. So it's not necessarily the fact that you have to compute all these scattering probabilities at every time step in the context of self-interacting dark matter. Or uh, in the case of hydrodynamics that you have are solving quite a lot of equations in motion together. The thing that really drives up the computing time is the fact that if you have high density regions that you just have to take really tiny time steps. And so that, that's what really blows up the computation time. Um, my uh, student, Carton Jung, is about to submit a paper where we explore this phenomena and um, have a few workarounds to speeding some parts of the computation up. But um, it's... Uh, so self-interacting dark matter is basically annoying because you span a wide range of regimes. And then when the density goes up, then you know the computing times really blow up. Okay, and the final non-CDM candidate and simulation type that I want to talk about is fuzzy or wave dark matter. So this is the case where the 
occupancy of states is super high. And so it's really more appropriate to think about dark matter as some sort of field or wave rather than um, a set of individual particles. And so you get really very different phenomenology for these fuzzy dark matter models. Um, and that actually means that you need a different set of um, equations to solve <laughs> um, and methods to solve them. So this is a, a, a snapshot from a paper by Shiva et al. from 2014. This sort of kicked off the current um, excitement about these wave type dark matter models. Um, interestingly, this core here is a soliton. And then these ripples here are actually short-lived fluctuations just in the density field. Um, okay, so it looks more like a percolating, you know, mass rather than uh, particles flying around. So these aren't individual subhalos, these are just short, short uh, lifetime fluctuations in the field. Um, and in the Google Doc, uh, the reference Google Doc in the Google Drive uh, that you should have access to, um, I list a bunch of references that I got from my collaborator, Xiaolong Du, who's a fuzzy dark matter expert, um, on different methods and considerations for simulating fuzzy dark matter. One thing I should say is that the public ENZO, uh, N body and hydro code, now has a fuzzy dark matter module in it. So if that's something you want to play with, um, ENZO might be a good first place for you to start. Okay. So let me stop here and ask if there are any questions. window. Okay. Yeah, I don't see anything in the chat. Yeah, I don't think that. Uh, okay. So if you guys are interested, I would like to just talk about one cool uh, aspect of simulations or one application that it reveals a phenomena that you just would not find if you're doing any sort of analytic or semi-analytic calculation. It's something that is fully, something you can only fully explore in simulation, having to do with dark matter. Okay, great. Um, okay, that's a great question I see in the chat about separating halos and fuzzier wave-like dark matter models. Uh, I think you can still use standard halo finders, but I would have to ask um, Xiao Long um, for more details. Um, that's a great question. Hi. He's a bus. I'm giving a talk. Okay, so Hi. as promised. <laughs> um, okay, do you want to just sit here while I finish my talk? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, uh, okay, so. This is a really cool thing that I'm going to show you. And uh, uh, this comes out of some work that my collaborators, um, Gertina Besla and Nico Garavito Camargo, have been doing with the Large Magellanic Cloud. So I came into some of their work in the context of dark matter direct detection, but they have done a whole lot of other work uh, exploring very cool dark matter effects uh, or observables. Uh, as a result of the large Magellanic cloud crashing into the Milky Way. How did it crash? Well, it just fell in. So the large Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud, which we collectively call the clouds, um, probably live in the same dark matter halo. Probably the small Magellanic cloud was a, a huge satellite of the large Magellanic cloud. And the system we think fell in together a few giga years ago. Now, the Magellanic clouds are have massive dark matter halos. 
So in terms of stellar mass, the clouds are, uh, you know, only a few ha have only a few percent of the stellar mass of the Milky Way. But because of the sharp um, drop in the stellar mass to halo mass relation, uh, as you go towards smaller halo masses, what the clouds actually live in halo, uh, a halo that's probably 10 or tens of percent of the mass of the Milky Way. Mommy, our so it's, it's a giant perturber. Can you hold on to your question for a couple minutes? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the Magellanic clouds have these massive halos. And so it's a big perturber to the Milky Way. And there are a lot of important consequences to that. So I'm just going to point out one. So one of the really important things about the clouds, not only are they really massive, but they're almost certainly on their first infall. So that means, and the clouds are close to paracenter, which means they, the clouds are moving very, very fast with respect to the center of the Milky Way. And intriguingly, and this is just sort of a coincidence, um, is that the um, clouds are coming in kind of oppositely directed from the solar motion. And so that means as viewed from the sun, the Magellanic clouds have just an incredibly high speed. Um, okay. So it's a really unique geometry and having a big halo come in with a close paracenter and have it be that paracenter passage have been pretty recently is uh, sort of a unicorn uh, phenomenology. Um, okay, the other thing is that the Magellanic clouds are, the stellar part looks pretty intact. Now they're, this big gas stream called the Magellanic stream. Gas in galaxies tends to be much more extended than the stars. So for the clouds, a bunch of the dark matter has been stripped and a bunch of the gas has been stripped, but the stars are pretty much unperturbed. So for what I'm gonna show you, there is not a direct stellar tracer when it comes to Magellanic cloud stars. As we'll find out, there will be a tracer of this interaction in the Milky Way's stellar halo. Okay, so a couple things happen when the, like, if I'm going to put on my dark matter hat now, which I obviously am, there are a couple of really important um, dark matter effects as the clouds come by. One is that a lot of dark matter is tidally stripped from the Magellanic clouds. So this is an image from one of Nico's uh, papers. Um, and Nico is just starting now as a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Flatiron Institute um, in New York. But you can see here that there's a bunch of dark matter being stripped off of the clouds. You get a leading arm and a trailing arm. This is the center of the Milky Way. And you can see that there's this enormous volume of dark matter just being pulled off the clouds. Okay, so we get a lot of tidal, dark matter tidal debris. The other thing that is really important and is actually pretty amazing and something that you can only really study in simulation is the fact that the Magellanic clouds as they pass through the Milky Way induce a couple of transient phenomena in the Milky Way's own dark matter halo. Transient orca. Yeah, or some orcas are transients, that's true. Okay, so there are two phenomena. One is dynamical friction. So you can actually see a tail of Milky Way dark matter particles that are basically being gravitationally slingshotted behind the Magellanic clouds. And that wake slows down the Magellanic clouds. And so this is like dynamical friction in action. So that's this dynamical friction uh, trailing wake. You also get a collective response of the halo, basically a resonant phenomenon in the halo, which um, Nico and Gertina called the collective response. And so you get these two transient um, dark matter Orcas. signals um, in the Milky Way's halo. Okay. Amazingly, this response you also see 
we also predict for the stellar halo of the Milky Way. So the Magellanic Cloud's passage through the Milky Way stellar halo will induce a similar effect that you basically slingshot stellar halo stars behind the clouds, and then you get this collective response in the stellar halo, as well as the Milky Way's dark matter halo. Collective spot of salmon uh -huh. for orcas. OK, you can tell that we are just, uh, anyways. We have a <laughs> connection here. Um, OK, and so this is something that's um, actually hi been guys, observed. Yes, yes, yes. I need to focus here, OK. Um, um, okay, so this has actually been observed uh, using stars uh, from uh, observed uh, with Gaia and with the WISE satellites. So this is a simulated stellar overdensity field on account of the Magellanic Cloud. So we got the collective response up here and the wake, this transient wake down here. Uh, the, this is a map of predicted over and under densities of stellar halo stars. And this is what was observed using this uh, the set of stars characterized by the Gaia and uh, WISE um, satellite uh, telescopes. And so this is amazing to see this effect of uh, the clouds um, on the uh, dark matter and stellar halo of the Milky Way. Uh, this actually has consequences for direct detection. Um, so this is uh, uh, a case where we are showing uh, the velocity distribution of particles in the solar. Oh, that's, uh, theta or rho of minus one. Where's the purple? Uh, I think on the previous slide, it had a theta rho. Oh, yeah. The rho bar goes all the way to minus one. Yeah, so this is the over density or under density of stars relative to the average density of stars in this case um, at some radius. So it's like the over density or under density with respect to um, sort of a spherical, the average in a spherical shell. So minus one is basically there's no dark matter? Or no star. Um, actually for this, uh, so this would be like a 100% over density here. So you have like twice as many stars as you would have in an average slice at about, I think this is at about 60 kiloparsecs. So it's a 100% over density, and then you get these under densities in certain places. But you don't max out the scale in blue the way we do in red. OK. And so I, I, I had a question, but I, I guess it's my fault. So we're sure we're OK. Um, yeah, so, so it looks like the observations actually have, like, have more of this sort of sharp, dy well, I don't know if dipole is the right word, but you know, like it, yeah. over density looks almost more pronounced in the observations than in the yes. simulations. Is there an understanding of why that might be? Yeah, that is an awesome question. So they talk a little bit in the paper about what's going on. So one is that they've only chosen basically one set of initial conditions for the Milky Way Magellanic cloud system. And actually, they don't have a small Magellanic cloud in their simulations, just a large Magellanic cloud. Uh, and so what they really need to do is an exploration where they add, for example, a small Magellanic cloud, change the orbit a little bit to within the sort of like uh, family of orbits that are consistent with the, the current measurements of the cloud's proper motions. And that you've got to change the Milky Way and cloud mass models. All of those things matter. So, yeah. Um, OK, and so this has an effect actually for direct detection, because zooming in on uh, the solar neighborhood, what we find is that um, we get a bunch of tidal debris of the LM the Magellanic clouds that's above the escape velocity from the Milky Way. And so this is, of course, a very transient effect and just has to do with the special nature of the LMC's what's orbit. The, what's and the, what's LMC? Large Magellanic cloud. And then you also get basically an acceleration of Milky Way particles on account of the Magellanic clouds passage through the halo. And so that's the difference between the red and uh, dashed black line here. 
the red line shows where we where the clouds have accelerated Milky Way dark matter particles. What's the dotted line? Um, escape velocities. And so if you look in a galactocentric frame, this is now on a log scale for the velocity distribution. You can see that you really get this big effect at large velocities. Now, as it turns out, because the sun and the Milky and the large Magellanic cloud are almost sucker punching each other, it means that uh, you also see a big enhancement in a geocentric frame. And so this, um, this actually has some significant consequences for the detectability of low mass dark matter particles in direct detection Mommy, experiments. What? You get this vastly increased population of very fast dark matter particles Mom, in the solar neighborhood. Mom, so check out our paper if you want to learn more about the direct detection consequences of having the large Magellanic cloud uh, in what, the Milky Way. What's dotted blue? This is the total velocity distribution of dark matter particles, including the contribution of the large Magellanic cloud and the Milky Way. Okay, sorry, could you? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Sebastian has a great question. So the dotted line versus the red line here, can you say again? Okay, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so the dashed line here is a simulated Milky Way without, a Magel without the Magellanic clouds. And then this red line denotes Milky Way particles when you have a large Magellanic cloud passing through. So the red line here is only Milky Way particles, but the difference between these lines shows the dynamical effect of the LMC on Milky Way dark matter particles in the solar neighborhood. Thank you. And then the, the difference then with this, the blue dashed line here is that included now in the velocity distribution is dark matter from the LMC. So you've got the red shows Milky Way particles only when you've got the clouds. This black dashed line is an isolated Milky Way. And then the this blue dashed line is the total dark matter uh, velocity distribution of particles in the solar neighborhood uh, with particles um, uh, originating both in the Milky Way and the large Magellanic cloud. And so check out this paper. Um, I should add that Nico and Gertina are running a set of simulations with other types of dark matter. So these simulations that they ran are just cold dark matter. I should note that they ran them with Gadget 3, sort of this intermediate version of Gadget. Um, and they used um, uh, equilibrium initial conditions generator um, that I have linked actually in one of the, um, the description of which is linked in uh, one of the exercises. Um, um, but yeah, so expect more to see if we get similar weird features in the Milky Way's uh, stellar and Milky Way halos if you have dark matter other than cold dark matter. And so that's work that Nico and Gertina are, uh, have in progress. Okay, so I thought that was just really cool. <laughs> I love the dynamics nerd in me loves to see dynamical friction in action. And I also love that there's this like very neat dark matter sig signal um, just on account of the Milky Way happening to have these massive perturbers that just pass through a close paracenter. This is model two, not model one. Yeah, yes, that's correct. Why well, just has model one? Okay, because we have two different models. And actually, another thing that matters now that my kid picked up on it is that the velocity <laughs> distribution of dark matter particles in the Milky Way matters too. So if you have isotropic dark matter orbits in the Milky Way, you actually get a different collective response than if you have particles that are on more radial orbits or on more tangential orbits. So the orbital structure of Milky Way dark matter particles matters a lot too. And that's interesting because the velocity distribution of Milky Way particles prior to Magellanic cloud impact also depends on the assembly history of the Milky Way. So there's this incredibly interesting intersection between 
um, the assembly history of the Milky Way and uh, the most recent giant merger of the Milky Way, which is the clouds. So it's just really neat. The dynamics nerd in me loves it a lot. Okay, so that's kind of it in terms of lecture type content that I had prepared. Um, uh, what sort of things do you all want to talk about? Why am I invisible? And why do parts of me become invisible? I don't know. What is happening? They're going to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Hair. <laughs> oh, yeah. huh? Hello, thanks. Um, you talked about this some, but I would love to know a little bit more about the interplay between um, dark matter simulations and indirect detection and what dark matter simulations can tell us about the specific signals that we're interested in for indirect detection. Oh, that is a great question. So there are like a thousand different ways I could take that. Um, um, so more, more like 10,000. Okay. So, uh, so there, so one um, application, this is uh, one of the reasons for the running of the Aquarius simulations uh, 10 years ago by Bokash Pringle et, et al, was understanding the contribution in the Milky Way of having a whole bunch of really small substructures. So what is the, uh, so basically like, if you have dark matter annihilation, that's a row squared process. And so if you have dense clumps of dark matter, those, the dense clumps are going to be, enhance your indirect detection signal. And so for Aquarius, um, and actually there's a great, recent paper by Wong and Bose et al. Um, on trying to simulate um, cold dark matter halos at a variety of scales, is that um, you want to know how many small dark matter halos there are. For CDM, that's actually more or less straightforward to figure out because you, have, you end up having essentially a scale-free hierarchy of halos. Oh. But another thing that matters tremendously is what is the concentration of those halos? Basically, how dense are halos as a function of halo mass? Um, and so what simulations can tell you is basically um, uh, how dense and how many subhalos you have. And then you can calculate, um, like for example, for the Milky Way, a global um, indirect detection signal from that. Um, so that, that would be one example. Of, of it. Another is if you can understand, like, you know, we have all these satellites of the Milky Way, and one of the best constraints on uh, the WIMP annihilation cross section comes from basically staring at these satellites with the Fermi gamma ray space telescope. So, mm -hmm. Tracy is in the audience, you know, I'm sure Tracy has like a billion more things to say, <laughs> but like, um, one of the issues is that some of the satellites that give you the strongest signal are also really close, and we don't really understand their dynamical state. So if those satellites like Segway-1 are tidally perturbed, then the dynamical mass that we measure with stars is maybe actually spurious, that maybe the dark matter you know, distribution in those objects is different from what we would expect based on these stellar dynamics assuming an equilibrium distribution of stars. So simulations can help you understand what are the likely dynamical states of um, objects. There are many other things that I could say, but those are just a couple of examples that um, uh, are coming to mind. Maybe I can indulge myself and oh, yeah. follow up on that. Yeah, because we were actually in my lecture this morning, we were having a discussion about substructure and uncertainties in substructure. So, like, yeah, I, I, and I had been telling them that, that if you end up in a situation where you think your annihilation signal is dominated by the very small subhalos, then that can be pretty difficult to get at, just because obviously in 
like large box. It, it, it's hard to simulate the very tiniest sub hair loads, but they can go down to very low masses. Can you, you've probably been following this more carefully than I have. Do, do, I, I was wondering, could you say anything more about that, about like progress in, in understanding yeah. the concentration behavior of the smaller sub hair loads and yeah. about those uncertainties? Great, thank you. So this actually is gonna lead me into two different directions. One is for a standard vanilla inflation and CDM model where you have like a scale-free power spectrum. So uh, this paper by Wong and Bose et al. from last year, it was a paper in Nature um, and it's sort of a collective work from the Durham uh, collaboration. They showed that actually very small halos have not very high concentration. Um, so that the concentration max out, um, you know, well below a concentration of 100. Um, and so what that means, and so that's a lot lower than sort of, um, sort of analytic or semi-analytic yeah. predictions. And so that's going to reduce the annihilation signature uh, compared to this, uh, you know, the large annihilation signatures that people were super excited about like 10 years ago when Fermi was just, you know, launching. Um, I guess it's more than 10 years I, ago. I, I definitely like, remember the Pavlov extrapolations down to yeah. orders of magnitude, which led to uh, very impressive looking signal predictions. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people were super excited about potentially having a very large annihilation signature. For standard vanilla inflation and cold dark matter WIMP type models, that seems less likely. On the other hand, there's been some really interesting work done um, uh, by Adrian Erickcheck and her work at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and in particular work led by her former student, Sten Delos, uh, where they've been experimenting with um, different uh, reheating histories of the universe. And they've also been experimenting with having different um, small scale features in the matter power spectrum. And there, if you get dark matter, what are called ultra compact mini halos forming um, at very early times in the universe, um, those can enhance the um, uh, annihilation uh, rate. Um, and so I would strongly recommend checking out um, Sten Delos and Adrian Erickcheck's papers on that subject. Um, but basically the short version is you have to, you know, uh, tune the small scale power spectrum or change the reheating history of the universe to get um, <laughs> to get a, an enhanced uh, annihilation signal. Okay, thanks, that's, that's very helpful. I, I missed the um, long ago's paper, so that's, uh, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess my, my feeling is, yeah, so, so the setting constraints, you probably want to assume that there is not ultra compact mini halos unless you're specifically trying to constrain that scenario, but the purposes of could we see something interesting um, then yeah, ultra compact mini halos would potentially provide a significantly larger signal than you might expect yeah. without those features. Yeah, so definitely check out check out those papers. Sten wrote just an enormous number of very good papers in the like last year <laughs> of his uh, time at UNC. Um, yeah, and so I, I, I followed the UCMH story a little bit. We had a paper a couple of years ago where we were trying to figure out any way to see tree body dark matter annihilation in indirect yeah. detection, and you really need something really dense. So we, yeah, yeah. exploring this a little bit, but yes, it's really cool. Thanks very much. Other questions? Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll ask one. Uh, so you had this, um, Fast Fourier transform for the blocks uh, for the grids. Why was that useful? Why is it useful to do a Fourier transform? Um, so it's just that you can solve. Oh, sorry. Let me see if I can get back to the slide. Uh, sorry. Let me go back. Um, so. 
so for these grid codes, this tends to be a pretty fast way of calculating gravitational forces, um, especially if you don't have enormous over densities or under densities. What I should say is um, this grid is, you know, a very regular grid. Most grid codes actually now have what are what's called adaptive mesh refinement. So you have nested layers of grids. But this is just one approach that can be fast, especially um, when you don't have um, a whole lot of super dense knots of matter. Um, and so uh, really typically codes will adopt a hybrid approach where they use one method to calculate gravitational forces on small dense scales and then have a grid, grid approach um, for these larger scales. Um, so would wavelength decomposition be small? I mean, that would be like uh, an intermediate uh, thing. It would do wavelengths. Do so, wavelengths? Would that be useful or no? Sorry, uh, so you said something about intermediate scales, but I couldn't quite catch oh. all the words on either Instead side. Instead of, of doing Fourier transform, you could do wavelets. Wavelets, oh yeah. So I think, so uh, wavelets haven't been used so much, but there is a short discussion of wavelets in that review article by Fogelsberger et al. Um, but, I neither read that part very carefully, nor have I used wavelets myself. Um, okay, sure. Other yeah. questions? Um, okay, maybe I'll ask another one. So this fuzzy dark matter, so what was the time scale of the oscillations that this, or like you showed us this? Um, oh, yeah. Um, they're like, trying to remember. So Xiaolong, my collaborator, is really the expert on this. Um, these are sort of like tens to hundreds of million year fluctuations, at least in the simulations. Um, he's been experimenting with different methods to try to model the effect of these uh, without um, uh, yeah, he's been working on ways to model the effects of these fluctuations without doing a full fuzzy dark matter simulation. But yeah, so they are transient on sort of like, you know, 10 to 100 million year ish time scales. They're not like age of the universe type fluctuations, nor are they super short. They sort of reflect the local dynamical time. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Anika? Last chance. Uh, so on on a Zoom call, if you have a question, you can just uh, raise a hand and uh, ask. So maybe while you're doing that, I'm going to stop sharing this and uh, share the exercise folder of just Google Drives, just to maybe orient people in case they want to do some exercises at some point. If that's okay with you, you all? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. So, um, okay. okay. All right. So, in this Google Drive, there's a set of lecture notes and references. So basically, every time I <laughs> resave the PowerPoint, you, you, a new version populates here. Um, the simulations reading list is, I don't know, fairly extensive, although um, I could add some of the stuff about indirect detection. I just haven't done that yet. But um, anyways, there, there are a bunch of different categories of papers. So if you want to learn more, dive into here and just, um, you know, uh, start your own literature safari, uh, in the words of my collaborator, Anna Nirenberg. Um, and then for exercises, I drop them in in different folders. I should warn you that some of these exercises are really like 20 hour <laughs> type things. Some of them are a lot shorter. Um, 
So if you're looking for places to just get started doing stuff, there are a couple of these that are a little easier than others. So one is mass loss. This is based on a problem that I give to my um, uh, galactic dynamics um, grad students when I teach that course. And in this problem, uh, this is a great way to write your own leapfrog integrator and then integrate the orbit at the Earth. Uh, if the sun uh, suddenly or gradually over time loses mass. Um, so that's, if you just wanna get started with leapfrog integrators um, and look at a fun application, um, I would recommend starting there with mass loss. Um, another one that you can go through is this GalPy exercise. So I talked about GalPy, which is Joe Bovey's Python package for um, modeling the orbits um, of stars or uh, other objects um, around galaxies. And so um, definitely check out Joe Bovey's GalPy page. There's some, it, uh, you know, obviously aside from extensive documentation, he also has some quick start exercises. I also wrote a, Py a Jupyter notebook of just some features that I wanted to point out to my dynamic students. And then I have a couple of problems in here for you to do that are sort of based on that. So those I think are the two things that take relatively less time. Um, other things that will take more time is simulating the Tatooine system, which is really fun, uh, but does take some more time. Or you can make your own static halo, which again is fun, but takes more time. Uh, and then there's some uh, ideas for um, uh, playing with uh, public simulation data or downloading and playing with a public uh, and body simulation code. So anyways, these are just some ideas to maybe get going in your brain if you're interested in uh, any of the things that I talked about over the past few days. These are just some ideas of places to get started as you're going into your own study of any topic that might be of interest to you. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? I, I maybe, uh, yeah, so I, I guess if it, since we have some time, I will ask the um, big general looking forward question. What are you most excited about in the next few years in this area? What's, oh. what's going on the pipeline? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that uh, my group has been um, interested in is uh, using simulations to train semi-analytic models. So let me unpack that a little bit. And then I can also talk about like simulation stuff that I'm excited about and observation. So I think the really exciting motivator is that uh, there are a bunch of facilities that are coming online soon, which are going to be, if you're an astrophysical dark matter nerd, really revolutionary. So um, the Vera Rubin Observatory is scheduled to be uh, commissioned or the camera of it commissioned in um, 2023. And so, so the LSST survey with the Vera Rubin Observatory is going to cover half the sky at incredible depth. So uh, we're going to find a ton of dwarf galaxies. We're going to find a lot of gravitational lens systems. We're going to be able to study enormous quantities of systems that are awesome tests of dark matter. There's also going to be Euclid, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, a bunch of other wide field surveys, which really are driven for and paid for by dark energy, but like uh, dark matter science is going to be amazing from these um, facilities. So right. what you need to, in order to make the best use out of those data sets are simulations and other theory methods to really make predictions for these facilities and then to be able to do the inverse problem of being able to constrain dark matter properties from the observations that you uh, are that people are making with these facilities. 
Uh, one of the challenges is that the dynamic range for the predictions is huge. So for example, for gravitational lens systems, you know, you're trying to resolve dark matter subhalos that are about 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus seven, the mass of the host. Um, and we're going to have a lot of systems, so we need enormous theoretical statistical ensembles of uh, mock systems to test. And when you think about like likelihood function evaluations uh, or any other like approximate Bayesian computation to sort of see how your theory model and realizations in your theory model match the observations, it's just a lot. <laughs> you have a huge dynamic range over which you need to simulate even one individual system, and then you need many realizations of that system for many different cosmologies. And so one of the things that my group has been working on is uh, trying to do fast and accurate realizations for different types of dark matter models. So we're my student Carton Zhang and I, and we have a new student, Charlie Mace. We're working with um, Anthony Pullen, Andrew Benson, Francis Yan, Sir Racine, and Leonidas Moustakas' group to try to really um, speed up uh, theoretical calculation. So it's a combined simulation, semi-analytic model approach to studying systems. But anyways, I'm also really excited about the next generation of n-body plus hydro simulations. For example, the really high resolution work uh, from the EDGE collaboration in the UK and the N-Body Shop collaboration in the United States. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of things to be excited about, but it's mostly we really need to up our game in terms of predictions for the next set of astronomical facilities. And so it's just a very exciting time. Dark matter precision astrophysics. So uh, there's a question on the chat. Yosha, do you want to unmute yourself and just uh, ask it? Hey, uh, thank you very much for an interesting talk, Annika, uh, and lectures. Uh, actually, I would like to ask about the hydrodynamics section where you introduce this uh, smooth and particle hydrodynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, so one there uses these kernel, kernels to approximate the densities. Actually, mm -hmm. could you elaborate a bit on how one then get, for example, uh, the coordinates of, of the next time step? How 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 the, the whole procedure of a time step goes. Okay, um, Thank you. For, great. So for that, I would um, refer you to um, either Fokas Springer's um, Gadget 2 paper, so from 2005, or the SPH review articles that I have linked in the, um, in the, the Google Doc. Uh, they will really walk you through what happens in each time step. One of the complicated things is that for these simulations, you usually have a bunch of different time steps. So in the very dense regions, you take few time steps, and then you take longer time steps in the less dense region. So um, if you look at Fokker's um, Gadget 2 paper, he talks about how to set this dynamic range of time steps um, and what happens within both each big time step and each little time step and how to set those time steps. There's usually some criterion which, um, uh, which um, governs the size of the time step. Um, Perfect, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, okay. Just about the next one question. <laughs> uh, hello. Um, yeah. Two years ago, a uh, journal group uh, published a uh, very interesting work on decaying dark matter, and we were uh, mentioning that it could mitigate some uh, of the small scale issues such as the missing satellite problem. But now I think the status of the missing satellite problems has changed due to the new data from Gaia and other observations. Uh, do you think it would be worth it to do a follow up of these uh, simulations of decaying dark matter in, in the future? Uh, I am, have a run a decaying dark matter simulation uh, or worked with them in uh, about seven years and it's not um, 
it's not something that I am likely to do soon. <laughs> um, as you say, the, the status of the missing satellites problem has changed. Uh, if anything, there's maybe a too many satellites problem. Uh, although whether you think that's the case or not depends on your closely held belief about the radial distribution of satellites in halos. Um, I think the broader issue is that um, the astrophysical constraints are getting much tighter. Um, and this is really, you know, 20 years ago, people could, I'm not gonna say hand wave, but kind of hand wave constraints. Um, the constraints are getting much better. And so the dark matter community, or at least the astrophysical dark matter community really needs to be thinking about dark matter astrophysics as a precision science. And, you know, basically figuring out how to likelihood functionize um, a lot of our observations and simulations better. Um, so anyways, that was sort of like a long and circuitous answer to a fairly sharp question, but the short version is no, I'm not planning to run decaying dark matter simulations um, soon. I think decaying dark matter is really interesting, but um, uh, I've mostly been focusing on um, self-interacting type models recently. Uh, other questions? Otherwise, I'll ask mine. Uh, could you tell us a bit uh, about the computing requirements uh, because of practicality for doing uh, different simulations? Oh, yeah. So it really depends on the resolution of your simulation and what physics you're including. So the really high resolution dark matter plus hydro simulations that um, of the type that are going into like the, you know, and body shops, uh, DC Justice League, uh, mint uh, level um, simulations, those are like 10 to the seven CPU hours. Uh, these sort of simple stage simulations that, you know, Stacy and Carton and I have been running, those can be more like 10 to the three, 10 to the four CPU hours. So the big cosmological zoom in simulations tend to be really expensive. And the big box simulations like the illustrious or eagle simulations, those can also be extremely computationally expensive. And typically you run the biggest simulation you can given the computer allocation that you get. The biggest sort of allocations that people talk about are like 10 to the eight CPU hours which is just staggering. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you basically do as much as you can given the resources that are available to you uh, when you're really gunning for resolution. And how many CPU hours for the, for the homework? Or the... <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, these are, these are small. I mean, uh, all of these you should be able to just do on your laptop, um, um, except, Maybe for get the Gadget 4 one, um, I haven't run there. So in Gadget 4, Flickr has like a whole suite of like initial conditions and parameter files, like basically a little intro test to run. I haven't run those in a long time. Uh, I think they're mostly ported from Gadget 2. Maybe for those, you might want to run on a desktop <laughs> with, you know, if you have a, a number of cores on your desktop, but um, all these others you should just be able to do on the laptop in a not, you know, crazy amount of time. Like by not crazy, I mean. That's good to hear. Yeah, for t the Tatooine one is probably the one that takes the longest, and that still should be way less than a day. Um, just so a we have at most. five minutes left, so it's basically. And then one of the last questions I have in chat now. If there's a, a last burning question, that doesn't seem to be since everybody's happy. So, in that case, uh, let's thank Annika again. <laughs> so thank you very much, Annika, for uh, the set of lecture, especially for the discussion. Sure. Thanks for asking great questions. Uh,
I would also